years later. My name is Elsa Soto, and I'm a student advisor here at Henley Putnam University. We have a number of participants joining us today, so we'll wait a minute before we get started. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the latest webinar series from Henley Putnam University. Today we discuss the USA Patriot Act 13 years later with Mr. Mike Angley. Before we start the webinar, I'd like to tell you a little bit about us. Henley Putnam University is a leading educational institution specializing in the field of strategic security. Our, field, our faculty is chosen for their vast knowledge and experience in the field. The university offers accredited online bachelor and master's degrees in intelligence management, terrorism and counterterrorism studies, and strategic security and protection management. We also offer a doctorate in strategic security and several certificate programs. The university is nationally accredited by the Distance Education and Training Council. You can complete your course of study online with monthly start dates. We have experienced student enrollment professionals here ready to assist you. To learn more about us, you can visit our website at www.henley-putnam.edu. Now I'm going to turn this over to Nancy Reggio. She has some logistical information to go over before we get started. Thank you for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed today's webinar. Nancy? Well, thank you, Elsa, and thanks to everyone on the line for joining us today. I want to share just a few reminders with you before we kick off the webinar. First, your lines are on mute, and we do that to reduce the background noise. But we do want your participation, so if you have questions, please use the questions widget. you find it on the right-hand side of your GoToWebinar control panel. If you chat those over to me, I'll make sure that we revisit those during the Q&A period, which we'll do at the end of the webinar. Second, we are recording the webinar so you'll be able to access the full audio and all the slides from today's session, and you'll find those on the Henley Putnam website at the end of the week. And with that, I turn this over to Mike Angley. Well, thank you, Nancy, and uh, thank you, Elsa. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be, and welcome to this special edition of Henley Putnam's webinar series. This particular webinar is focused on the often controversial Patriot Act, that was passed following the terrorist attacks of September 2001. Most people know the act by its short name, the Patriot Act or the USA Patriot Act. But the actual full name of the law is, quote, Uniting and Strengthening America, USA, by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism, Patriot. So yes, USA and Patriot are actual acronyms. It's also known by its legislative bill name, which was HR 3162, and Public Law 10756. Well, now that we have all that formal stuff out of the way, let's get on with the meat of this presentation, which is oriented toward a before and after look at how the Patriot Act shaped and changed the way the US law enforcement and intelligence communities approach things like wiretaps, voice intercepts, computer evidence, warrants, and so forth. These are the topics I'll discuss, starting with a little information about my background in the Air Force. I'll discuss why we as a nation crafted the Patriot Act, beyond the obvious fact that we were attacked. It's important to understand that the Patriot Act served to change and reform existing laws 
to make it easier in some respects for law enforcement and intelligence to obtain information in terrorism investigations where time is of the essence, as well as to deal with changes in technology that prior law had a difficult time contending with. I'll dive into the main part of this presentation, many of the actual changes themselves. Time won't permit me to discuss them all, but I will talk about several of the main ones and indeed the most controversial ones. I will do this as a before and after type discussion because I want to be able to explain how things stood on September 10th, 2001, and then show how the Patriot Act modified things following the terrorist attacks that occurred the next day. I mentioned a moment ago that the Patriot Act is controversial and it may so particularly because many of its major provisions have been extended in time despite sunset clauses built into the original legislation. As a result, there have been some calls for reform. Those calls have only increased following the 2013 revelations about the National Security Agency by a former contractor named Edward Snowden. I'll go into those issues in some detail and explain what the major issues are that people and groups have wanted to see changed. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm both a retired Air Force Colonel and a retired Special Agent with the Office of Special Investigations. And to put that into some perspective, the OSI is to the Air Force what NCIS is to the Navy and Marine Corps. I spent a little over 25 years in that line of work, uh, experiencing both the realm of federal law enforcement as well as counterintelligence, uh, anti-terrorism, counterterrorism. Moved around quite a bit, commanded several times to include an, an OSI wing and I currently serve as the senior military advisor to Henley Putnam University. Now, first and foremost, I am not a lawyer. Although this presentation digs into the law deeply, I do so primarily from the perspective of a former law enforcement officer and a former member of the intelligence community. I was fairly senior in OSI following 9-11. So my time from then on was largely in command billets, not working the street or operational level. While I don't have the practical experience of working with many of the uh, new provisions in the Patriot Act directly. As a commander, I did review all requests that my field unit submitted and became familiar with the processes and the rules. And many times I found myself on the carpet having to explain to senior leadership what, what it was that my people were doing with the new tools that they had at their disposal. Let's talk about the events of 9-11 and the reasons why we have the Patriot Act today. During the weeks immediately following the 9-11 attacks, Comprehensive legislation to close certain loopholes in America's existing national security laws was drafted in the form of the USA Patriot Act. It passed with a lone dissenting vote in the Senate and a mere 66 dissenting votes out of 435 that were cast in the House of Representatives. It was signed into law by President George W. Bush on October 26, 2001. The Patriot Act was really not a dramatic departure from existing legislation. Indeed, its key provisions were incorporated from an anti-terrorism measure that had been passed by Congress and signed into law by former President Bill Clinton five years earlier. This was the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, which was a response to Timothy McVeigh's April 1995 bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City that killed 175 innocent people. The Patriot Act became the cornerstone of America's domestic security program. Most significantly, it removed several Clinton-era restrictions that had erected what were called walls of separation, preventing intelligence officials and law enforcement officials from sharing information with one another and collaborating on investigations. This restriction had effectively crippled the government's ability to fight terrorism and was arguably culpable for at least part of government's failure to avert the 9-11 attacks. The Patriot Act also gave the Treasury Department more leverage with which to disrupt terrorist financing networks. It gave the Attorney General slightly more authority to detain and deport uh, terrorist, uh, suspected terrorist aliens. It allowed law enforcement officials to obtain a single search warrant covering any and all localities where they suspected terrorist activity might occur, rather than having to go through the time-consuming process of obtaining several warrants for each location and it increased the penalties for those guilty of committing terrorist crimes or harboring terrorists. Let's take a closer look at some of the major provisions in the Patriot Act, specifically having to do with how government obtains information in support of terrorism investigations with a before and after examination of those changes. There were about two dozen major changes to a variety of existing federal laws that the Patriot Act ushered in. 
Time constraints prohibit discussing them in uh, any kind of uh, level of detail. Uh, therefore, I'll focus on just the nine that you see on this slide because they're oriented toward electronic surveillance activities as well as the execution of search warrants, the areas of the law that tend to attract the most scrutiny and criticism, and for good reason. For your reference, you can always Google the Patriot Act and download and read the, the provisions and changes in the act itself. Many of the areas that I don't cover in this presentation have to do with computer hacking, cyber terrorism, financial terrorism networks, um, how the government targets them, measures taken to better integrate law enforcement and intelligence, the walls of separation issue that I mentioned previously. First of all, let's talk a little bit about obtaining voicemail and stored communications. Under previous law, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, or ECPA, part of Title 18 of the United States Code, govern law enforcement access to stored electronic communications, such as email, but not stored wire communications, such as voicemail. Instead, the wiretap statute govern access to stored voicemail because the definition of wire communication included stored communications, arguably requiring law enforcement to use a wiretap order rather than a search warrant to obtain that type of communication. To the limited extent that Congress acknowledged that data and voice might coexist in a single transaction, it did not anticipate the convergence of these two kinds of communication typical of today's telecommunication networks. With the advent of MIME, or multi-purpose internet mail extensions, and similar features, an email may include one or more attachments consisting of any type of data, including voice recordings. For example, I use Vonage in my home, and if I miss a call, Vonage will email me a visual voicemail, which is essentially a text of the, uh, the actual voice recording, as well as a WAV file, which I can listen to and hear the actual voice recorded, recording. These types of situations were never anticipated when the original wiretap and ECPA laws were drafted. As a result, a law enforcement officer seeking to obtain a suspect's unopened email from an ISP uh, by means of a search warrant, uh, as required by the ECPA, had no way of knowing whether the inbox included voice attachments, such as wire communications, which they could not compel using the search warrant. Well, the Patriot Act altered the way in which the wiretap statute and the ECPA apply to stored voice communications. The amendments essentially deleted certain language for wire communications from the definition and inserted language to ensure that stored wire communications are covered under the same law as stored electronic communications. Thus, law enforcement can now obtain such communications using a search warrant rather than those in the wiretap statute as required by a wiretap order. In other words, the convergence of these two type of media under one procedure for search and seizure now enables law enforcement to obtain both types of electronic information using, using less cumbersome procedures, resulting in a speedier acquisition of evidence. Let's talk next about the scope of uh, subpoenas and electronic evidence. Previously, the government could use a subpoena to compel an Internet service provider to provide a limited class of information, such as a customer's name, address, length of service, and means of payment. The list of records that investigators could obtain with a subpoena did not include certain records, such as credit card number or other form of payment for the communication service. That was considered relevant to determining a, a customer's true identity. I know this may come as a surprise to many people, but in many cases, users register with an ISP using a false name. In order to hold these individuals responsible for criminal acts committed online, the method of payment was considered an essential means of determining true identity. Moreover, many of the previous definitions in the statute were technology-specific, relating primarily to telephone communications. For example, the list included local and long-distance telephone toll billing records, but did not include parallel or similar terms for communications on computer networks, such as records of time, uh, session times and durations. Similarly, the law allowed the government to use a subpoena to obtain the customer's telephone number or other subscriber number or identity but not the, did not define what that phrase meant in the context of Internet communications. The Patriot Act updated and expanded the narrow list of records that law enforcement authorities may obtain with a subpoena. It now includes records of session times and durations, as well as any temporarily assigned network address. In the Internet context, such records as the Internet protocol or IP address assigned by the provider to the customer or the subscriber for a particular session as well as the remote IP address from which a customer connects to the provider. 
Obtaining such records will make the process of identifying computer criminals and tracing their internet communications faster and easier. Also, the Act clarified that investigators may use subpoenas to obtain the means and source of payment that a customer uses to pay for his or her account with a communications provider, including credit card and bank account information. While generally helpful, this information has proven particularly valuable in identifying the users of internet services when a company does not verify its user's biographical information. I find this one kind of interesting, the, the scope of the Cable Act, especially um, when I tell you about how restrictive the Cable Act makes it for, uh, for law enforcement. The law previously contained two different sets of rule regarding privacy protection of communications and their disclosure to law enforcement. One governed uh, cable service, the so-called Cable Act, that's part of Title 47 of the United States Code, and the other applying to the use of telephone service and internet access, the wiretap statute and the ECPA that I just briefed upon in the previous slide. Prior to Patriot Act changes, the Cable Act set out an extremely restrictive system of rules governing the law, law enforcement access to most records possessed by a cable company. For example, the Cable Act did not allow the use of subpoenas or even search warrants to obtain such records. Instead, the cable company had to provide prior notice to the customer, even if he or she were the target of the investigation. And the government had to allow the customer to appear in court with an attorney and then justify to the court the investigative need to obtain the records. The court could then order disclosure of the records only if it found by clear and convincing evidence, which was something considered a, a standard greater than even probable cause, that the subscriber was reasonably suspected of engaging in criminal activity. This procedure was completely unworkable for virtually any criminal investigation. The legal regime created by the Cable Act caused grave difficulties in criminal investigations because today, unlike in 1984 when Congress passed the Cable Act, many cable companies now offer not only traditional cable programming, but also internet access and telephone service. Treating identical records differently depending on the technology used to access the internet made little sense in, in today's uh, world. Moreover, these complications at times delayed or even ended important investigations. Well, the Patriot Act clarified that the ECPA, the wiretap statute, and the trap and trace statute govern disclosures by cable companies uh, to the extent that they relate to the provision of communication services, such as telephone and internet services. The amendment preserves, however, the Cable Act's primary uh, or primacy with respect to records revealing what ordinary cable television programming a customer chooses to purchase, such as premium channels or pay-per-view shows. Thus, in a case where a customer receives both internet access and conventional cable television services from a single cable provider, a government entity can use a legal process under CP ECPA to compel the provider to disclose only those customer records related to internet service. Now, Mike Angley's side note, I've never understood why protecting what television uh, programs a person watches merited such tight control and access. It's easier for the government to listen to your telephone calls than it is for the government to find out if you watch the Disney Channel. Now, I'm all for civil liberties and privacy, but I think we, we seem to have gotten this one a little bit backwards. That's just my two cents. Let's talk about this one. It's kind of interesting. Uh, what kinds of emergency disclosures can communications, uh, communication providers, telephone companies, uh, internet providers, uh, what are they uh, allowed to disclose to law enforcement or what are they required to, uh, to provide? Previous law relating to, vol to voluntary disclosures by communication service providers was inadequate in two respects. First, it contained no special provision allowing providers to disclose customer records or communications in emergencies. If, for example, an internet service provider that one of its customers was part of a conspiracy to commit an imminent terrorist attack, prompt disclosure of the account information to law enforcement could save lives. No one can really argue that. Since providing this information did not fall within one of the statutory exceptions, however, if an internet service provider made such a disclosure, it could be sued civilly. Second, prior to the act, the law did not expressly permit a provider to voluntarily disclose non-content records such as a subscriber's login um, to, uh, to law enforcement for purposes of self-protection, even though providers could disclose the content of communications for this reason. But the right to disclose the content of communication necessarily implies the less intrusive ability to disclose non-content 
records. Moreover, as a practical matter, providers must have the right to disclose to law enforcement the facts surrounding attacks on their systems. For example, if an ISP customer hacks into that ISP's network, gains complete control over an email server, and reads or modifies the email of uh, other customers, the provider must have the legal ability to report that crime to law enforcement. The Patriot Act corrected both of these inadequacies in previous law. It permits but does not require a service provider to disclose to law enforcement either content or non-content customer records in emergencies involving an immediate risk of death or serious physical or bodily injury to others. This voluntary disclosure, however, does not create an affirmative obligation to review customer communications in search of such imminent dangers. The Act also changed the ECPA to allow providers to disclose information to protect their rights and property. It accomplishes this change by two related sets of amendments that now regulate all permissive disclosures of content and non-content records alike. This is uh, one of those areas, uh, delaying notice of the execution of a warrant that um, really gets people's hackles up. Uh, but it's actually nothing necessarily new. Its application is somewhat different now. Under prior law, the delayed provision of notice that a warrant has been executed was a, mis a mix of inconsistent rules, practices, and court decisions that varied widely between jurisdiction to jurisdiction across the country. The lack of uniformity hindered the investigation in terrorism cases and other nationwide investigations. The Patriot Act addressed this problem by amending Title 18 of the United States Code to create a uniform statutory standard authorizing courts to delay the provision of required notice. Uh, there's a section in the law now that provides for the giving of notice within a reasonable period of a warrant's execution, which period can be further extended by a court for good cause. That section also is primarily designed to authorize delayed notice of searches rather than delayed notice of seizures. The prov uh, provision requires that any warrant issued under it must prohibit the seizure of any tangible property, any wire or electronic communication, any stored wire or electronic information unless the court finds reasonable necessity for the seizure. So in other words, uh, um, warrants issued under this uh, delayed notice uh, process allow law enforcement to look into a uh, person's uh, communications, uh, look around, uh, look for evidence of a crime, but not to seize any, and unless the court says that there's that reasonable necessity for the seizure. The reasonable cause standard uh, adopted by the provision is in accord with prevailing case law for delayed notice of warrants. It's also in accord with the standards for exceptions to the general requirement that agents knock and announce themselves before entering and that the warrants be executed during the daytime. So in other words, this is sort of the electronic version of a no-knock warrant. The requirement of uh, notice within a reasonable period is a flexible standard. The law was intentionally made vague uh, in order to meet the circumstances of the case. Case law regarding a reasonable period for delayed notice of warrants is still developing. The Second Circuit has interpreted it to mean ordinarily a seven-day initial period for delay although subject to additional extensions. Other courts have suggested that the reasonable period could be significantly longer. Now this is one of the more controversial changes that the Patriot Act brought about because it allows the government to conduct surreptitious search for evidence, essentially a black bag type operation, without immediately disclosing to the person affected that the search was conducted. Uh, opponents have called these secret searches and I guess that's a fair term, but the fact remains that sometimes evidence needs to be examined in such a way so as not to tip off the people being searched that they're even under scrutiny. In terrorism cases, it may take additional time to properly identify all the members of a cell since most sophisticated terrorists use excellent cover and compartmentalization with their activities. Under prior law, uh, the federal rules of criminal procedure required that a search warrant be obtained within a district for searches within that district. The only exception was for cases in which property or a person within the district might leave the district prior to the execution of the warrant. Now this rule created unnecessary delays and burdens for the government in the investigation of terrorist activities and networks that spanned a number of different districts, since warrants previously had to be obtained separately for each district. The Patriot Act resolves that problem by providing that in domestic and international terrorism cases, a search warrant may be issued by a magistrate judge 
in any district in which the activities related to the terrorism have occurred for a search of property or persons located within or outside of that district. Another one of the controversial ones, these nationwide searches for emails. Previous law required the government to use a search warrant to compel a provider to disclose unopened email less than six months old. Because federal rules of criminal procedure required the property to be obtained within the district of the issuing court, however, some courts have declined to issue warrants for email located in other districts. Unfortunately, this refusal placed an enormous administrative burden on those districts in which the major ISPs are located. And in the United States, that happens to be the Eastern District of Virginia and the Northern District of California, as you could imagine, the Silicon Valley area. Uh, even though these districts may have no relationship with the criminal act under investigation. In addition, requiring investigators to obtain warrants in distant jurisdictions slowed time-sensitive investigations. The Patriot Act fixed that. It allows investigators to obtain warrants to compel records outside of the district in which the court is located, just as they use the federal grand jury subpoena and orders. This change enables courts within ju with jurisdiction over investigations to compel evidence directly without requiring the intervention of agents, prosecutors, and even judges in the districts where the ISPs are located. This one is probably um, the most misunderstood, and, um, and, and it's certainly one of them that uh, causes a great deal of concern uh, among people, and it has to do with the change in the statute of limitation for terrorism offenses and the whole idea of material support to terrorism. Now, most non-capital federal offenses uh, previously were subject to uh, five year, a five-year statute of limitation, and under prior law, many terrorism offenses were subject to an eight-year statute of limitations. Uh, this all under Title 18 of the United States Code. The Patriot Act provides that any offense listed in Title 18 under the section pertaining to terrorism may be prosecuted without limitation of time if the offense resulted in or created a foreseeable risk of death, serious bodily injury to a person other than the defendant. Now this makes it possible to prosecute perpetrators of such terrorist attacks wherever, or excuse me, whenever they are identified and apprehended. This particular change has been met with controversy because it means that anyone who does anything with respect to terrorism, such as harboring them or providing financial support, is now rolled in under the no statute of limitations change. Critics have charged that even people who sympathize with terrorists could be prosecuted for their beliefs, uh, essentially interpreted to be providing material support. Now, I doubt that to be the case, and much of the concern, I believe, has been overstated. But because the language in the law was, is rather vague, I can understand why people may, may have those concerns. The section uh, expressly prohibit, or provides rather that it's applicable to offenses committed before the date of enactment of the statute as well as those committed thereafter. This is a retroactivity provision and ensures the, the section's limitation period reforms will apply, for example, to the prosecution of crimes committed in co connection with the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks. The uh, constitutionality of such retroactive applications of changes in statutes of limitations is well settled. The last major change I'll talk about to the Patriot Act has to do with national security letters, another, another one of those areas that really uh, causes a lot of consternation. National security letters have been around for some time. They were not created by the Patriot Act. They, they certainly preceded them. But they've been a key component in, uh, for the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA court process. NSLs have been used prior to 9-11 mainly to go after individuals who had some nexus to foreign intelligence. In other words, the chief focus was a counterintelligence or a counterespionage uh, perspective and not for purposes of counterterrorism. An NSL is essentially an order prepared by the FBI. It's authorized by a magistrate to obtain records, usually from banks and credit card companies, about clients or subscribers. It functions like a search warrant, but it falls short of the judicial review for a warrant because they're used to obtain business type records and not to seize personal documents, for example, from someone's home. NSLs have always been controversial, and the concern over them has only grown with their expansion in the process following the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act expanded the use of NSLs to the realm of international terrorism and added a provision that some have called a gag order, because those who have been served at NSL are prohibited from disclosing that fact 
anyone. In crafting language for the Patriot Act expansion, Congress established an oversight mechanism that requires the Attorney General to report twice a year on the status of all NSLs that have been issued. Also, the Patriot Act went out of its way to add language to ensure the FBI did not use NSLs to target U.S. persons for simply exercising their First Amendment rights to free speech. That grew out of a lot of concern people had. Uh, like, for example, the FBI could go to the local library with an NSL and demand all records of every book you read to see if you were reading anti-government type literature. And uh, a lot of people said, you know, that's, that's going a little too far. So the, the language was changed to ensure that this was not being used to target people for uh, exercising their First Amendment rights. Because of concerns over NSLs and many of the other provisions in the Patriot Act, there have been some calls or some active voices um, against the law since it was adapted in 2001. Many groups have called for reforms of the Patriot Act, and that's the next area that I'll explore. The Patriot Act has certainly been the source of great controversy ever since it was adapted right after 9-11. Critics at the time worried that the speed with which it was passed meant there was little time to have a public debate, a discussion, or even a review of what the changes would mean. Now keep in mind, it was signed into law about six weeks after the terrorist attacks. That's pretty, uh, pretty quick, considering the size of the law. Proponents argued that we had, uh, we had to rush the process because we had no idea if more terrorist cells were in existence in the US. And since we put sunset clauses in the act, there would be opportunity for debate later. Um, I would say, though, as a side note, um, it's my understanding every time there's a sunset clause, uh, period comes up, the law has been extended anyway. So that may, not have, uh, that may have been a well-founded concern on some people's part. In general, the fear then and even today is that as government extended its, uh, expanded its authority to obtain information about you, that your civil liberties and freedoms were being eroded. There's been a fear that we've created a big brother type environment. It's important to note that although the law passed nearly unanimous, unanimously in the House and Senate, there were lawmakers who had doubts. Every time one of the sunset clauses comes up for review, the Anti-Patriot Act sentiment grows. Individuals and groups like the American Civil Liberties Union uh, have, have uh, put pressure on Congress to halt any renewals. Let me focus a little bit on the ACLU's uh, main opposition to the Patriot Act because it's been the most ardent opponent, and many of its concerns are typical of what most people have at issue with the Patriot Act. ACLU has many concerns, but the three that I'll focus on uh, here have have the most to do with the uh, NSLs, the national security letters that I just mentioned, uh, the issue of material support of terrorism that I touched upon when I talked about the statute of limitation and how that now rolls all terrorism-related offenses into an unlimited statute, and finally, uh, issues with the requirements involving the FISA court and its use of uh, national security letters for terrorism. I use much of the language the ACL itself uses about these issues right from its own website, which I recommend everyone take a look at to have a better understanding of what these concerns are. The ACLU wants to repeal the expanded national security letter process and what are called Section 215 or 215 authorities that allow the FBI to demand information about innocent people who are not the targets of any investigation. They want the government to reinstate standards limiting the use of Section 215 and NSL authorities to gather information only about terrorism suspects and other agents of government power. Uh, they want the um, government to issue gag orders only upon the authority of a court and only when necessary to protect national security. The ACLU wants to limit the scope and duration of such gag orders and ensure that their targets and recipients have a meaningful right to challenge them before a fair and neutral arbiter. They also want to impose judicial oversight of all Patriot Act authorities. When it comes to material support, ACLU wants to amend that part of the statute to uh, require specific intent to further an organization's unlawful activities before imposing criminal liability. They want to remove overbroad and impermissibly vague language such as training, service, and expert advice and assistance from the definition of material support. That's one of those areas that uh, many people have expressed concern about because, for example, if someone were to post on a Facebook page uh, 
Um, I love ISIS, the terrorist group that's uh, in Iraq and Syria right now, and I think those guys should bomb XYZ location. Someone might say that's giving expert advice and assistance, uh, and that could subject the person who posted that on their Facebook account to fall under the material support to terrorism and the unlimited statute of limitations uh, for possible prosecution in the, in the future. The ACLU feels that the government should provide notice, due process, and meaningful, meaningful review requirements in the designation process and permit defendants charged with material support to challenge the underlying designation in their criminal cases. Now, at the same time, the ACLU notes that, notes that there's been a significant increase in the use of things like NSLs, FISA orders, and suspicious activity reports processed by the FBI since 9-11. While the ACLU sees this as evidence of abuse and intrusiveness, I think a fair argument can be made that much of this is a result of two other things. One, increased terrorist threat following 9-11. You would expect if we have had an increased threat in terrorism that we'll see an increased need for the use of these tools. And the fact that the Patriot Act intentionally expanded authorities for obtaining these types of tools in, uh, to aid in the fight uh, against terror. After all, it would, be got, it would be odd for the government to grant law enforcement and the intelligence community certain authorities and then tell them not to use them because by doing so it would be evidence of abuse. Now, I won't uh, get into who's right or who's wrong on these things, but I wanted to present some of this information about the opposition to the Patriot Act because of its past and continuing controversy. And that brings me to some more recent controversy. Mr. Edward Snowden, in 2013, a former NSA contractor named Edward Snowden left his home in Hawaii with copies of massive amounts of sensitive information concerning the inner workings of the National Security Agency. He told his story to reporters at the UK Guardian newspaper in England who began publishing the documents and other information he turned over. The first revelation of the uh, NSA files was publication of a top secret court order against Verizon Business Services mandating Verizon to hand over the call records, essentially numbers called when the calls took place and for how long for all of its uh, customers. Subsequent reporting confirmed similar orders made under Section 215 of the Patriot Act that existed for other telecom firms in the United States. And they were used to obtain or to maintain a database of all call records, a continuation of what's been called a warrantless wiretapping system begun under George W. Bush. Other stories centered on programs that allowed for large-scale collection of people's data without any individual warrants. The first and best known is PRISM, a system allowing the NSA easy access to the personal information on non-US persons from the databases of some of the world's biggest tech companies to include Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Yahoo. Later it was learned that Microsoft had actually worked with the government to circumvent its own encryption system to enable NSA easier access to customer records. Other, type, uh, or other data is collected from extensive cable tapping operations, the collection of both metadata and the content of communications traveling through the fiber optic cables that make up the backbone of the internet. Details of a system known as X key score, which is used to collect, process, and search these vast troves of data was also uncovered. One presentation published in a redacted form in The Guardian claimed the system allowed NSA analysts to query, quote, nearly everything a typical user does on the Internet, including the content of emails, websites visited, and searches, as well as their metadata. The system works in almost uh, real time, uh, according to the documents. But just as important as the technical capabilities of the NSA are the legal and policy safeguards restricting their actions. As the first NSA files stories were published, senior Obama administration officials and the president himself gave repeated reassurances that Americans' privacy, if not that of foreigners, was strictly protected. However, secret documents presented a very different picture. Targeting policies dating from 2009, the, re the rules on what the agency can target and which data they're allowed to keep show the large range of circumstances in which the agency could retain data on U.S. citizens if it had been, quote, inadvertently swept up in its mass collection systems. U.S. data that couldn't be separated from foreign data due to technical limitations could be kept until it was examined, the document ruled. 
Once examined, it could be kept if it contained usable information, information on criminal activity, threat of harm to people or property, was encrypted, or was believed to contain any information relevant to cybersecurity. Under certain circumstances, even attorney-client conversation could be retained. The rules were relaxed still further two years later. Further documents revealed allowing analysts to search for U.S. citizens within their warrantless databases under certain circumstances. Now, many people in and out of government have felt that the explanations for what was being collected and retained amounted to tortured logic and was an abuse of the Patriot Act as well as the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. Snowden's revelations only serve to increase calls for reform, and they have been used by politicians seeking election based upon a promise of reform. No one can argue that the Patriot Act changed things. It altered the way the U.S. law enforcement and intelligence communities do business, and it's altered how we as citizens think about safety, security, and basic civil liberties and freedom. It's almost axiomatic that for every ounce of power that the government grows and gains, we as citizens lose an ounce of freedom. We elect lawmakers to represent us, and if we don't like the laws we have, we elect people to change the laws to what we want. We as a free and open democratic society have to make decisions about the balance between safety and security and these individual freedoms. Opposition to the Patriot Act is healthy in my judgment, and it keeps us from acting as sheep, being herded by a big government into a world we may not like, because bureaucrats tell us they know what's best for us, even when we know it just doesn't feel right. Despite the worry about the PA, Patriot Act, I don't necessarily share many of the same concerns. There are oversight mechanisms in place, good, bad, or indifferent. These are designed to double check and triple check what the government does. Between Congress, mandatory attorney general reports, the IG process, and the media, as we've seen with the, uh, the Snowden situation and the UK Guardian, we can police ourselves to a certain extent. That doesn't mean abuses won't occur, just that there's less likelihood of it. Early on after 9-11, we were not attacked right away as a country. Some would argue that the Patriot Act had a lot to do with that. However, within the last few years, we've seen a resurgence of attacks. We had Fort Hood, where a lone Army soldier turned jihadist, opened fire on several of his uh, fellow soldiers. We had the attempted bombing in Times Square, the attempted bombing on an airplane by the underwear bomber. We had the Boston Marathon bombing. In recent months, we've seen the rise of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, the ISIS group. Its threat has expanded, extended beyond the Middle East to our own continent. We've seen ISIS-inspired lone wolves, like the man who attacked the Canadian soldier recently, uh, the beheading at an Oklahoma food processing plant, and a hatchet attack against police officers in New York City. These have all happened despite the Patriot Act. So it's still, uh, is it still effective, or does it need re, uh, further refocus and reform? Those remain important questions. At this point, I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much for listening in. Thanks so much, Mike. We do have a few questions. Um, so let me get started right with those. Um, one of the questions is, I've heard the Patriot Act allows for something called roving wiretaps. Is there really such a thing, and if so, how does it work? Yeah, that's, um, that's a sort of a, a colloquial term that's been used to describe a couple of the processes that I mentioned um, during the presentation. Um, the idea that warrants don't need to be obtained and executed only within a specific federal uh, district, that uh, they could be used outside of the district, so the idea that um, one search warrant issued by a, a federal judge can be used anywhere in the United States in pursuit of evidence uh, against terrorism. And the other has to do, there was a, uh, one of the procedures had to do with nationwide searches for email. And very similar to the idea that one warrant obtained in one jurisdiction could be used throughout the United States is kind of where the roving wiretap thing came from. You know, if the government's pursuing someone in, in cyberspace, and the individual is hopping around from um, one server to another and bouncing around, that's happening in milliseconds. The government doesn't have time 
to go find a judge in the middle of the night as it jumps from the individual jumps from one connection to another and pursue him around the country obtaining search warrants at each location because by the time they do that the individuals you know obviously long long gone or the crime's been committed or the evidence has been destroyed so what the the concept of a roving wiretap uh, as it's been been called probably a little bit of a misnomer it allows the government to continually pursue without having to break off connection and go after someone wherever they happen to be. Now that's within the United States, you know, a lot of times crime, cyber crime, terrorism, uh, terrorism as it, it's being used through the internet for being um, facilitated, as terrorists are facilitating their activities through the internet. They cross international borders, that makes things a little more problematic, but at least, uh, you know, the Patriot Act has done something to help speed the process along as it pertains to uh, going after evidence in the United States. And so, yeah, that's sort of a good term, but it's not quite accurate. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, another question. Uh, if Snowden were to come back to the U.S., do you think the federal government would prosecute him, or would it let him off in exchange for cooperation and learning what he stole from NSA? Well, I don't think Snowden would ever come back unless he had some type of an agreement with the government. Um, however, I, I don't know that the government would really offer him much of a deal because what he did from a federal law perspective is, is very serious. And uh, there's going to be a, a desire to prosecute him one way or another and um, not necessarily be too lenient because the, the government would be anxious to send a message to anybody who might want to leak in the future that there's a high cost to be paid for that. At the same time, the government has a strong desire to find out exactly what he took from the NSA and where that information happens to be. The longer he remains uh, out of our control and continues to leak whatever he stole, um, the less of a good deal he's going to have on the table because you know at some point in time he will have exhausted uh, any type of bargain he, he could potentially give the United States. It's not unusual in leak investigations um, or, or even in espionage investigations to, for the government to make a deal with someone. You know, you tell us exactly what you provided and we'll, you know, we'll give you uh, X number of years off your, your plea bargain here with the government. Um, but in Snowden's case, I think that's going to be problematic for him because the information that he provided was considered so grave and so serious that uh, it's caused a tremendous amount of uh, trouble for the federal government, not just in terms of exp uh, exposing um, programs, but hundreds of millions of dollars uh, have been lost. You know, the government develops programs, spends a lot of money to protect those programs. We don't want the bad guys to know that we can uh, do certain things with our technology. and uh, once that, that uh, portal has been ex, uh, exposed and people know that it's exploitable, uh, they're going to go and do different things and we have to now spend hundreds of millions of dollars to find ways to exploit new nodes of communication and so forth. So um, I don't expect you know, Snowden to uh, come back and uh, never spend a day in jail. I, I imagine he would be offered something, but it wouldn't be a terribly attractive bargain. So I'm not sure he would come back as a result. He may stay on the lam. Great, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, so why don't we finish with, some people fear that if they post things to social media which show sympathy towards terrorists, that they could be prosecuted under the material support law that the Patriot Act now says has no statute of limitations. And is this true? Yeah, you know, I kind of touched upon that in the presentation where I, I kind of gave a for example that, you know, one of the areas people have concern about is some of the language in the Patriot Act that pertains to material support is vague. And it uses words like expert advice and assistance. You know, what does that mean? Uh, if, if someone posts, um, you know, something and it might be construed to be providing assistance to the enemy, even if it's just, hey, I like you guys, um, you know, is that considered some type of material support and would they be prosecuted for that? I, 
I think there's so much gray area, it's hard to say that every case is going to have to be determined on an individual basis. I don't imagine the government going after someone for saying, I think ISIS is a great group of people. Material support comes in when we find out, like for example, I'm here in Colorado and we had the, the three teenage girls in Denver um, express their love for ISIS and they wanted to support jihad and so they were picked up in Germany en route to Turkey where they plan to go down to Syria and join the fight. That's pretty clear material support. They were going to go fight for the enemy so they can be prosecuted under uh, this part of the Patriot Act with an unlimited statute of limitations. Somewhere in between saying, I love ISIS and I'm going to go and get on a plane and join ISIS is that gray area that um, people worry about. You know, where's there the line? And it's going to be it, a lot of that's going to depend on how a prosecutor looks at it. Uh, a U.S. attorney may look at uh, something and decide, you know, is this exercising First Amendment constitutional rights and is it protected speech or is this actually material support? My best advice to people is uh, just be real careful and don't post stupid things on uh, Facebook that might might trigger one of those big ears at NSA that Snowden told us about to, you know, come looking after uh, look at everything you're doing on the internet to see if you're doing something beyond just expressing support for a, uh, a terrorist group. It's just to be very careful. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks. And thank you, Mike, for the presentation. And thank you to everyone on the line. Um, please do watch your email for the next notice of uh, next month's webinar. And with that, we'll say goodbye. And again, you'll be receiving your um, the link to the webinar, or you can just go right to our website at the end of the week and access all the information there. Again, thank you very much, and talk to you next month. Great, thank you.